So we're going to be talking about the uh, uh, example of using systems modeling in communities, and specifically, as Sarah mentioned, uh, Baltimore, Maryland. So moving on to the next slide. These are just some of our acknowledgements. Our, our work has been supported by a variety of different funders, uh, uh, mainly the NIH. Uh, and these are all listed here. Our presenters, uh, we, we don't have any relevant conflicts of interest to disclose. Next slide. So here's an overview of what we're going to talk about. We're going to have an overview of the Baltimore food system, uh, the specific project, uh, Be More Healthy Communications for Kids, uh, that participated, uh, that encompassed uh, what's happening in Baltimore, and then three examples of how systems modeling was used in uh, this uh, overall project. So next slide. So again, as, as a reminder, obesity uh, is a problem that's a systems problem. It's not uh, just an individual problem. It's really the result of multiple different complex systems like biological processes, interacting with behavior, interacting with social networks, uh, the environment, policy, economics, culture, and a variety of other different systems. This, this graphic basically is a, a simplifying graphic just showing some of the major systems that are involved. So we really wanna address obesity at a community level as well as any other level uh, we have to really focus on the different complex systems that are actually involved with this. And unaided, it's difficult to really untangle and address these systems um, because as humans, as I mentioned in the uh, previous panel, you know, we struggle to, to understand what's going on beyond direct immediate effects. So again, to address these complex systems, we really have to use systems approaches, such systems modeling. Next slide. So while at Johns Hopkins, I was executive director of the Global Obesity Prevention Center. Uh, this was funded by a U54 uh, grant from the NIH. And basically the goal of the uh, cooperative agreement from the NIH uh, was to establish a center that would uh, use uh, different types of systems approaches to address the obesity epidemic. Uh, this is just the structure of the slide is showing the structure of the center, which consisted of administrative core, a system science core, educational uh, training program, and various domestic and international projects. And one of the main projects was a community uh, level project, which basically focused on addressing obesity uh, in Baltimore. And, uh, and uh, Joel Gilson, uh, whom you'll be hearing from in a few minutes, uh, directed that project. Uh, so just to give you some context, the goal of the project was really to bring many different systems approaches, ranging from intervention studies to uh, traditional studies to understand all the complex systems involved, but also to use new systems methods and techniques such as systems mapping and systems modeling. So this is a project that lasted for over five years, and we're just giving you a few examples of some of the different types of models that uh, we developed as part of this project to really address uh, obesity. Specifically, we're interested in addressing the food system. You know, as you may know, uh, Baltimore, like many cities, has a variety of different food deserts, um, locations where it's really difficult to access healthy food. And they can actually be situations where the opposite is true. The only food that you can access readily are unhealthy foods. So we really wanted to use systems approaches and systems modeling to address these issues. So with that, I'm going to hand it over, hand over the virtual mic over to Sarah, who's going to talk a little bit about the uh, food landscape, food system landscape, and the food policy landscape in Baltimore. Sarah? Hey, thanks, Bruce. Um, I'm Sarah Bazogany. I'm the Food Resilience Planner for the Baltimore Food Policy Initiative, um, housed in the city's Department of Planning. And I'll talk a little bit about how we um, think about the food system in Baltimore um, and how our partnership has been really beneficial with Hopkins and the Global Obesity Prevention Center. Um, and so for the past 10 years, the Baltimore Food Policy Initiative has driven our city's food policy agenda in partnership with and alongside residents, organizations, um, and partners like Johns Hopkins. Um, these relationships between these institutions and the city on systems modeling have really been instrumental in having academia help us understand um, the potential implementation of strategies and plans, um, as well as identifying needs and viable policy solutions. So you'll hear about a few of those examples today. Next slide, please. 
So um, one of our frames is using food as a catalyst to address health, economic, and environmental disparities in healthy food priority areas. Um, in Baltimore, a healthy food priority area is essentially our evolution from the term food desert. Um, and it describes a geographic area of the city where residents may face structural barriers to accessing healthy foods. Um, we have a ton of information on our website, um, full reports on this food environment mapping and what the definitions for um, a healthy food priority area, all the different uh, variables and factors in that. Next slide, please. So this is the healthy food priority area layer of our food environment map. Um, this mapping work was done with another center at Hopkins, the Center for a Livable Future. Um, our full zoomed in map of our food environment shows all of these retail points listed to the right. So you can see we have over 500 corner stores in Baltimore, 183 convenience stores, more like chains like 7-Eleven and Royal Farms. We also have six public markets and 47 supermarkets. Um, those symbols to the right uh, identify their healthy food um, score. And so you can see that the smaller stores are uh, often very lacking in healthy food. Those are the average scores amongst all of those. Um, whereas supermarkets are essentially our kind of standard um, control for what a wide variety of healthy food is. So as well as these retail points on our food environment map, we show urban agriculture sites, food assistance sites like food pantries and um, summer meals. So please take some time to explore that if that's of interest. Um, but this mapping work um, has helped us provide briefs for elected officials as well as generate maps on demand for residents to understand um, their, land, their food landscape specifically in their neighborhoods. Um, but these static maps are only at a point in time they don't allow us to immediately show change or kind of ask the questions that, you know, we would need to know to create change. So we uh, partnered with Dr. Gittleson to essentially kind of help us ask the map policy questions, such as what if we had a stable foods ordinance in these 525 corner stores? How could that improve the quality of food offered? What would the financial viability be for store owners? Um, things like that. Also questions like, if we had a policy to dedicate more land to urban agriculture, what would that look like? Um, if you go to the next slide, please. Great. So this is our eight point healthy food environment strategy and um, the models that you're here about today and other work um, has touched almost all of those. Um, and so our collaboration uh, on these systems models tests policies and allows us to kind of tweak different variables to see how we could best implement those, as well as help predict some of their impacts. So with that, I will pass it back, or I will pass it over to uh, Dr. Joel Gittleson. Thank you very much. I appreciate that, Sarah. So I'm really um, happy to be here today. Um, so as Bruce has already alluded to, um, uh, the Global Obesity Prevention Center funded a large intervention program in Baltimore City called Be More Healthy Communities for Kids, which had the overall goal of improving the food environment. If you go to the next slide. So this, this model that you see here, maybe click forward. Okay, the model that you see here represents the different components of this complex uh, intervention trial, which included wholesale, food store, caregiver, youth leader, and policy level components. And um, the, it, the there's uh, quite a lot of complexity in this uh, intervention, but I wanna really emphasize the, the, the policy Piece. So if you do a few clicks, you'll come up, you'll get to the next slide. You'll have to go through the listing of the different partners and there were many different um, levels of people involved. So the piece that I'm going to emphasize right now is the work of what was called the Be More Healthy Communities for Kids Policy Working Group. And this uh, was a, included a series of stakeholders from uh, including uh, uh, the city food policy director, Sarah, um, uh, food resilience planner, members of the city council, the city health department, city schools, the family league, recreation and parks, and academic researchers. And we went through a series of planning exercises and activities to um, develop solutions and to consider solutions for improving the city's food environment. Next slide. 
So you, what you can see is there were two primary goals to – the first of which was to develop and build the evidence base to support policies for a healthier food environment in Baltimore City. A second was to figure out ways to sustain some of the activities. But um, of interest specifically to this group was the fact that we were directly requested to develop a simulation model to provide evidence for a potential urban farms tax credit. And so now I'm going to pass it on back to, to Sarah. Great, if you could go one more slide, please. Thanks. So um, the city's urban agriculture work has seen significant focus and movement towards equity and specifically racial equity over the past few years. Um, and stakeholders like the BHCK Policy Working Group on the Urban Ag Tax Credit have helped create some of that dialogue and shape the future of urban ag will look like um, here in Baltimore. And so again, from our 2019 sustainability plan, um, the intention is to focus a lot of these opportunities and policies um, on um, historically excluded populations. Um, and so if you go to the next slide, you can see some more detail on that. Um, and so, for example, the goals of our 2019 sustainability plan have a significant focus on land ownership, um, especially for black farmers and other farmers of color. Um, and policies like the Urban Act Tax Credit were created to help ensure that um, ownership is a viable option uh, once land is transferred or sold by the city. In Baltimore, we have um, both a liability and an opportunity in the fact that there's an extreme amount of vacant land here. Um, and so part of the intention of this Urban Act Tax Credit was to put that to productive use um, in a way that is actually um, viable and supportive of urban farmers and wouldn't then saddle them with huge property tax um, bills. So just before Joel goes into a little bit of more of the detail, since I have the mic, I'll talk about one um, good success story. Um, we have an urban farm owned by an older couple in Northeast Baltimore. They're African-American farmers who have been growing food on their property for a long time. Um, so securing this tax credit that he will talk about created um, a significant amount of um, security for their land as they looked into their future um, and will help them remain in farming as a steady source of income. Um, so that, that's been a great example of how this uh, credit that Joel will talk about um, has been put to use. And I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Sarah. On to the next. Okay, here we are. So uh, I just wanted to say a little bit more about uh, the urban agriculture uh, urban farm tax credit. Um, this, so we were approached by Councilman Pete Welch, who already had a a, a bill um, uh, that he had had proposed for an urban tar farm tax credit, which would provide a ninety percent tax reduction to owners of vacant lots if they converted them to urban farms. So that was the form of the tax credit, and we had an existing um, uh, agent based model. Um, uh, which we call Bee Life, uh, Baltimore Low Income Food Environment is the uh, the acronym represented there, which we actually modified to provide evidence in support of the potential impact of the bill. Uh, and you can see a picture of me providing some of the testimony of the impact of the uh, of potential impact of the bill that was modeled with the simulation. Next slide. This gives you a little bit of information. So the uh, the Baltimore low income food environment agent based model really only focused on a section of the city, um, about 10% of the city, uh, and it covered uh, essentially represented about an area of about 50 schools, 300 or so corner stores and carry out seven rec centers. And it focused on modeling the after school food consumption and activity of children. Next slide. This picture represents um, uh, the the information about some of the agents that were included in the model. We used actual data from um, from about nearly 300 uh, children who live in Baltimore. We had information on their their gender, their age, their height, their weight, their home address, and we modeled their walking, physical activity, food consumption. Next slide. 
This is the visual representation of what the, the user interface looked like um, that was developed using NetLogo. And the part that uh, is probably the most was the most interesting in, um, in some respects is that sort of middle big box where it, it essentially um, is a GIS mapping of that 10% of Baltimore City. And you could actually see uh, the agents move around that environment. Um, choosing to use corner stores or maybe a recreation center and so forth, which affected their BMI. So we provided this evidence, next slide, to the um, to the city council um, as a, in the form of testimony and um, as evidence of the potential impact of the urban farm tax credit. And this, um, this legislation was passed and uh, we now have a urban farm tax credit in Baltimore City. So with that, I'm going to pass it on uh, to Bruce. All right. Thanks, Joel. Uh, so as Joel mentioned, uh, the initial foray was building a net logo model. Uh, so it was limited to a specific area. And as Joel mentioned, it had about 300 uh, computational agents, each representing uh, a person. Um, and that's that proved to be useful in terms of testing different policies and interventions. So the next step is we said, okay, so we have initial that logo model. Why don't we expand the model uh, to include all of Baltimore? And then also, you know, start incorporating more aspects of uh, the food environment and the other things around each of the agents and also give each of the agents more characteristics. So we're basically greatly expanding this model because there, there proved to be this use uh, for such modeling to be able to really assess different types of potential policies and interventions. So moving on to the next slide. Uh, this became a uh, basically a uh, model that in which we could uh, really test the different types of uh, policies, uh, food policies and interventions. And you know, a lot of this was covered by uh, something that I wrote up in Forbes. Next slide. So as I alluded to previously, we've, we've developed this program called Virtual Population for Obesity uh, Prevention, or uh, VPOP for short, which has nothing to do with K-pop, but it's a sim city for uh, obesity prevention. And basically we can uh, develop uh, larger scale agent-based models of any location in any type of city. And here we see a map of Baltimore. So next slide. So this model basically included uh, representations of all key locations in Baltimore using geocoded uh, data. So we identify where all the uh, households are, many of the key wor uh, workplaces, all the schools, uh, key physical activity locations like parks, gyms, and recreation centers, and food sources. And these four food sources included things ranging from restaurants to corner stores to grocery stores to large supermarkets, basically any place that people can uh, get food directly or shop for food. Uh, next slide. And within each of, uh, within this model, the simulation, this agent-based model of Baltimore, we then placed computational agents and a lot more than the initial model. So in sub 300, we represent uh, millions of different agents, uh, each representing a specific person in Baltimore. So uh, each agent has an age, gender, race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, and many other types of characteristics. And this maps census data. So it's a representation of the actual population of the city of Baltimore. Next slide. And as I mentioned previously, uh, each of these agents have daily activities in which they move around. And so basically this is an interface showing how the model works. So let's drill down into, uh, the video is showing drilling down into uh, downtown Baltimore. And you can see the uh, uh, street grid pattern and the map there. And each of those uh, purple house-like uh, things actually represent uh, different food sources and locations. And we also have physical activity locations such as uh, parks. And each of these locations has different characteristics. So as you can see, we're representing some of the people moving around uh, and they're represented by circles. 
Uh, so you see people moving around and they're going about their day daily business. And if they pass by a corner store, they have a likelihood of stopping by the corner store or a restaurant or a grocery store, uh, depending on the time of day, depending on hung how hungry they may be because they have embedded metabolic models within them. And the type of food that they purchase and then ingest depends on the stock within the within the uh, location. So if a corner store is predominantly like 90% unhealthy foods, then they're more likely to eat unhealthy food and uh, vice versa. And we also included different types of things like they will walk in and they'll uh, be exposed to something and that might affect their decision making. So we're really incorporating many of the different aspects of the food environment here. And over time, we can track things such as the BMI percentile over time, or you know, how does the BMI percentile of the population change over time and other types of health measures. So again, this is like a virtual representation of Baltimore and it can serve as a virtual laboratory to test different policies and interventions. So next slide. So uh, we were, um, uh, in, during our interactions with uh, the uh, Baltimore Health Department, uh, they would periodically tell us, okay, we're very interested in this policy or we're interested in this intervention. And one of the policies they, they mentioned was that was being considered was uh, possibly introducing sugar-sweetened beverage warning labels to different uh, food locations. So you'd have, basically have a label that says, you know, sugar-sweetened beverage uh, beverages are associated with different types of health issues, such as BCD, et cetera. And such a label had been introduced uh, into the city of uh, San Francisco previously and was being considered in other cities as well. So this was an opportunity to really test this possible po policy slash intervention. So, th uh, so this led to the study, which ultimately was published in the American Journal of Preventive Medicine. Next slide. And we basically simulated the placement of these warning labels in different food sources, so different combinations of grocery stores, corner stores, uh, schools, et cetera, and trying to determine what would happen. And basically, what, uh, next slide. So basically, when someone would walk into the uh, uh, food source or the food location, they might see this uh, warning label and it might affect their purchasing uh, and consumption behavior. So there was a study that was done by another faculty member within our center uh, that looked at the um, uh, impact of uh, like a warning label in a sample uh, corner store. And they found that, uh, you know, 8% of the time people will change their decisions in terms of uh, the choice of beverage. So if they see the warning label, they may be more likely to purchase something like uh, water instead of soda. So we use that as a baseline, the 8%, but we then we want to also vary the efficacy of that. And so if you look at the x-axis right here, uh, you, you see no labels. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, the slide, no, no labels, 8% uh, efficacy, 4% efficacy, 12%. And this shows what happens if you put these different types of labels in different cities. So we had a, a representation of a agent-based model of Baltimore. We had an agent-based model of Philadelphia and San Francisco. And on the y-axis, you can see over time the decrease in obesity prevalence. And you can see as the efficacy of the warning label uh, increases, the decrease in obesity prevalence increases. So there's basically uh, more of a decrease in obesity prevalence. And this shows that the effects are rather heterogeneous uh, when you look at across different cities. And that's because these cities have different layouts. They have different types of food sources. They have different people there and different people with different combinations of uh, BMI distributions and also uh, different types of health conditions, et cetera. So you have the same policy the same intervention that's applied to three different cities, and the, it seems to have an effect in all different cities, even when the efficacy of the warning label is as low as 4%, uh, but the, there's heterogeneity in the differences. So this shows the importance of really explicitly representing the city, the population, the food environment when evaluating a policy or intervention, because you're going to get different effects depending on how the systems may differ. Next slide. 
And then we were also able to look at uh, sensitivity analysis in which we varied things like warning label efficacy, uh, literacy rate, corner store compliance, uh, and other things like that. So that's another uh, important use of systems model where you know once you have everything set up, once you have the simulation, you can test you know what happens if you vary different aspects of the policy or intervention, or what happens if you vary the circumstances. This helps you identify what the potential drivers are of the policy intervention. And many times that's even more important than predicting exactly what will happen. Uh, you know, many times there's a focus on modeling to say, okay, this is a crystal ball. And we know it's not an actual crystal ball, that things can vary. But we want to get a sense of what the relationships are and what's really driving the results. Because that's actually more important because the exact point prediction may not be uh, accurate or exact, but you can get a sense of what may be going on. Next slide. So with this, I'm going to uh, pass it back uh, to uh, Sarah, who's going to talk about a third example. We'll give the preface for a third example of using systems modeling uh, to uh, help with uh, Baltimore uh, community policymaking. Great. If you'll go to the next slide, please. So um, going back to our eight point healthy food environment strategy that I shared at the beginning. The first tenant um, was resident driven policy. So to help us accomplish that, we created the resident food equity advisors in 2017 to co-create policy with um, the planning department and government. Um, and so the advisors convened for two years on small food retail, um, which is essentially those corner and convenience stores, um, primarily the overabundance of corner and convenience stores in Baltimore. Um, and our advisors developed the four key priorities that you see to the right, um, and each of those had some recommendations. And so one of the specific recommendations that the advisors um, developed after um, many meetings and research from other cities and um, you know, going out into the community and talking to folks, uh, one of their recommendations was to require corner stores to carry a certain amount or a depth of stock of health promoting foods. Um, and so from this, we partnered with Dr. Gittleson to see what the impact of a staple food ordinance would look like. Um, this is a great example of residents co-creating policy as well as using systems models to help test and inform that policy um, and really was um, a good blend of government, community and academia all kind of contributing to this shared vision. Um, so I will turn it back to Joel, I believe. Great. Thanks. Please. Next slide. So um, uh, here's a, f a, s a photo of the model developers, um, including Sarah, myself and students and Holly's there in the middle. And the lower right, I want to acknowledge uh, Tak Igusa, who's a system science engineer we worked with and professor of engineering in the Homewood campus and his doctoral advisee, Xiao Zhu. Next slide. So um, in order to model a staple foods ordinance, it was decided to do a what is called a systems dynamic model to allow us to simulate inclusion of different foods and beverages and differing amounts in a potential Baltimore staple foods ordinance. And then use the model to recommend modifications to the ordinance. Next slide. So one of the first thing that we did was develop a essentially a flow chart of the, the different processes. This was after many, many iterative discussions amongst um, with Sarah and Holly and and uh, uh, the, the, the engineers and others. But essentially, you can see that it comes into three main boxes or groupings of factors. One is the supply, i.e. the factors and the set of um, of, of constructs that relate to the food retailers. And then on the right in the yellow box, the factors that reflect consumer uh, issues. And then upper upper left is the ordinance itself. And each of these are a variable, represents a variable that can be changed. Next slide. So this was um, a, a systems dynamic model was created, and this is the user part of the user interface for this model, uh, which would allow us to um, change uh, the values. And you can see it's divided into three columns, 
that relate to the ordinance itself. It's uh, sorry that relate to the ordinance to consumer demand and to the retail food store. So it follows those three boxes from the flow chart, but a series of sliders that can affect this. And and we ran next slide four different simulations using this model, and these were um, essentially the a the simulation of if a corner store were to adopt the basic SNAP requirements, or the 2016 proposed much increased depth of SNAP stock requirements for SNAP that the USDA considered at one time. Then the big example of a stable foods ordinance is the uh, experiment that was done in the city of Minneapolis. So we used the, we modeled, we did a simulation modeling the Minneapolis stable foods ordinance requirements. And finally, we modeled uh, the, the, the standard um, WIC requirements. Next slide. And this slide presents some of the uh, the details of the simulation and some of the background of the simulation in terms of the amount of required stock and foods that were required by the uh, particular simulation and the level of enforcement that uh, we detected based on our readings and what was communicated to us by the people who implemented this. Next slide. This is an example of one of the outputs of many outputs. Um, this is a uh, essentially a map of the or a picture of the weekly profit that ex corner stores could expect to uh, to reach if they followed the map, the SNAP minimum requirements for 22 different foods. And you can see it's 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 uh, at average it comes out to ninety dollars roughly per week. And the next slide. So if you take, if you compare the potential profit of each simulation uh, against the uh, with against the other one, you can see that the SNAP minimum requirements, the Minneapolis Staple Foods Ordinance, and the WIC requirements all lead to a small but significant increase or or level of profit. However, the SNAP depth of stock requirements are actually so onerous that they lead that they just were unsustainable in the simulation and really should never be considered unless you want every corner store in Baltimore to quickly go out of business. Next slide. And there are many other outputs that came from the simulation, uh, including the optimal price to set foods that to achieve the maximum um, profitability amount to order from suppliers that would lead to optimal sales and profitability and the least amount of waste, uh, the level of waste we could see, the level of community consumer demand and so forth. And the model, of course, did have some limita limitations. The, the parameterization data that we used to, to, um, to create the model was very reliant on um, data that we got collected from consumers and from retailers in Baltimore City. So it would take some uh, modification to make it uh, uh, usable in other settings. And the current simulation is really focused on the retailer impact of of, of this kind of ordinance and does not yet link to obesity or health. Next slide. So Bruce, I'll turn it over to you for the, the summary slide. Okay, well, thanks Joel and, th and thanks Sarah. So just to, to wrap up the presentations, uh, you know, we've shown how systems modeling can better address and understand the complexities of a community. And that ranges from all kinds of different things from the environment, from the from the people within the community uh, to the economics to all the kind of the social interactions, all those different types of things. Uh, Baltimore is an example of a community that has uh, significant disparities in terms of you know all those different factors and all those different systems. Uh, you know the um, uh, rates of obesity have have risen you know over the years, and this is an example of how we really can use uh, you know uh, virtual communities to really test different policies and interventions. Uh, we mentioned we gave a few examples. So there is basically you know, an initial um, smaller agent-based model, which then we blossomed into a, a much larger agent-based model that covered all of Baltimore, as well as system, system dynamics model to look at a very specific uh, policy and intervention. So we also had a range and suite of different types of models, and this was mixed in, as Joel mentioned with uh, th different types of intervention work that really engaged uh, the community and different stakeholders. Uh, Joel mentioned the uh, policy working group. And it's been great working with um, decision makers like Sarah and her colleagues, because you really have this, this um, 
uh, feedback iterative process where you want to make sure that you know, all of these things are actually aligned and they're interacting with each other because modeling can be effective in many different ways. It can help design um, different types of studies. It can help uh, guide data collection. But at the same time, the studies, the data collection, uh, and their interactions with different stakeholders then can inform uh, the model revisions and design as well and help expand the model and adjust the model in different ways. So it's really an editor process. And all of this can help uh, bring together different people and facility communication and engagement and bring together diverse stakeholders. So we do feel that even though this is an example of you know, a project where we use modeling to help facilitate many different aspects of work in the community, we're only really scratching the surface, that there's really a lot of potential for systems modeling to become even more integrated with community work and different types of um, research as well. Uh, so with that, uh, again, I uh, want to thank my colleagues and pass it back to our uh, moderator, Sarah, to uh, proceed with the rest of the session.